Blessed good morning, my dear brethren. Glory to God for another day. We come together in spirit and in truth to worship Him. And um, thank you for all those uh, who step in, uh, Brother Carlos and Brother Rex, for those who are who are not with us this morning. So this morning we will be discussing the uh, three words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when uh, he was on that cross. It is finished. In John chapter 19, part of our scripture reading this morning. Sorry about that. In John chapter 19, um, it says in verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finish and bowing his head he yelled up uh, he yielded up his spirit you know in the 19th century there was this man uh, named adolf diesman i hope i got uh, his last name correct uh, he discovered a various documents um, written in greek and um, it is believed to be dated uh, way back from the time of the new testament and on some of those documents the word tetelestai was written on those documents and there was a uh, signature on the document suggesting a completed transaction now the word tetelestai from the greek word for it is finished that is actually one word in greek and it comes from the root word telos, meaning reaching the end or the aim. Now, tetelestai is a business or accounting term that means paid in full, consummated contract, completed transaction, and to bring to an end. Okay. Again, we can read from the root word telos, meaning reaching the end or reaching uh, the aim. And that's where the uh, prefix in our word telescope came from, okay? which we, we zoom in until our eyes reach the aim of the main focal point in which we want to see. And um, also that's where our word telegraph uh, came from, which delivers a message through a wire by a signal to a desired recipient. Okay? And we also have you know, the telephone. Okay? Now, delivering words, delivering messages to a desired individuals across. Now, all of the examples, they are a means with one specific goal. And that is to reach an end, to reach its desired end, to reach its desired destination. So tetelestai meaning fade in full. It has reached its final destiny. It is a consummated a contract, finished contract. Now this means that Jesus paid something in full. Jesus completed the task that was assigned to him by the Father. Now Jesus reached the end of his purpose. And therefore, the word it is finished connotes the completion. It connotes the end of his task, of his work. Now, it doesn't mean the end of Jesus' life. No, he did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. Okay. So, again, he reached a point in his life wherein he finished his work that God the Father gave to him to finish. Now, before Jesus blurted out these three little words when he was up there on that cross, now in John chapter, 20, John chapter 19, verses 28 and 29, it says, after this, knowing that everything had now been accomplished and to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, 
So they soaked a sponge in wine, put it in a stock of hyssop, and lifted it to his mouth. Now, Jesus Christ was almost dried up, you know, from exhaustion and uh, from exposure to the heat of the midday sun. And after he was so beaten up, so as you can see, he was all dried up and he was so thirsty. Now, in Psalm chapter 22, verse 15, tells us that Jesus' tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth. So can you just imagine how dry Jesus was and how thirsty he was hanging on that cross on that fateful day? And it's hard for him to speak. It's hard for him to speak and it's hard for him to breathe. Now, having known the, the prophecy and for its fulfillment, he said, I am thirsty in Psalm chapter 69, verse 21. They poisoned my food with gall and gave me vinegar to quench my thirst. So when Jesus Christ asked for something to drink, and when he said, I am thirsty, they gave him a drink, a vinegar for that matter. Now, you know, I am so amazed how God puts every detail to the plan of salvation. If you will look at the, uh, the life of Jesus while he was hanging on the cross and those words of Jesus Christ, you can see how God detailed everything to its fulfillment, the plan of salvation. You know, up to this point where Jesus was given vinegar, it was prophesied, it was written that Jesus will be thirsty and that he will be given a vinegar. You see how detailed it was? The plan of salvation by God, how detailed God you know, puts it from the very beginning until the last breath of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And um, there was a purpose to fulfill that prophecy. Now, Jesus was given something to drink. Now you ask, but why? Okay. Now remember, it was all dried up, it was so thirsty, and he it was really hard for Jesus to speak. And it was hard for him to breathe because again, almost uh, every um, liquid from his body came out. And again, in, in, in Psalm 22, it says that the tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth. Now, why is it that Jesus wanted to drink in the first place? I was, I was kind of thinking why. And the reason that I uh, found out was the vinegar, which was happened to be given to him, was to moisten, was to moisten the tongue and the throat of Jesus Christ and somehow to clear up his throat. So that he could speak. Why? So that Jesus can shout in victory. And he shouted what? He shouted, it is finished. So Jesus wanted to clear out his throat and he wanted to, to moisten his mouth so that he could, in, 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 his, in his strength, in his final strength, so he could shout these words of victory. It is finish it is finished it is not a shout of agony it is not a, a shout of despair it is not a shout of defeat but it is a shout of victory so that you and i can also have that victory so you and i can be can be victorious at the end of our life because jesus said it is finished but the question is what did jesus finish what did he finish? Well, the very purpose of his coming to earth. That's what he finished. But then again, we would ask the question, what was his purpose? Number one, save us from our sins. In Matthew chapter 1, 21, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. You know, from the very beginning, the life of Jesus coming here on earth has a purpose. Again, everything was planned, very detailed by God. 
And from the very beginning, Jesus' life had a purpose. And Matthew 1 21 tells us that he will save his people. Now, by having given the name Jesus, Jesus' life was already committed and aligned to something specific. Now, Jesus was a man with a purpose. Jesus was a man with a mission, and that is to save his people from their sins. He knew from the very beginning, he knew from the very start what he must do. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? In Luke chapter 2, 49, did you not know that I must be in my, in my father's house? See, when his parents were looking for him, he knew what he would answer them because he knew what's his purpose in life. That's why he said these words. Now, when they found him, Jesus said, why are you looking for me? Now, notice his next sentence. He said, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? What does that mean? It was an answer of certainty. It was an answer of the certainty of Jesus' purpose here on earth. Now he knows his purpose. Okay. He said, did, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? At a very young age, he knew his purpose. And some people don't know why they do what they do. And again, there are even those who don't know what's their purpose in life. But Jesus knew from the very beginning what's his purpose in life. It was crystal clear to him what he must do. Now, Paul, in his letter in, in, to Timothy, he made it clear that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he said that I am the foremost. Now, do you notice something in the passage? The introduction of the passage, the introduction of Paul's testimony, or the introduction of Paul's words is a testimony in itself about Jesus Christ. When he said the word trustworthy, the saying is trustworthy. And the next one, he said deserving full acceptance. He was trying to get the attention of the audience and you know, he wanted to tell them, people, listen. He wanted his audience. He wanted to have the attention of the audience. And he was like telling them, you know, I want you to listen. People, listen. What I'm about to tell you is true without any shadow of a doubt. Trustworthy. That's what he was saying. And he said, since this is true, you need to accept it. That is the serving full acceptance that Jesus Christ now Paul was testifying about Jesus Christ about he is the truth and that we deserve to accept this truth and that the necessity of having Jesus Christ so when he said this word it was a testimony about Jesus Christ and it is a testimony of what Jesus Christ came to do and it was to save all of us to save sinners from their sins. Then he said, Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. And this was a clear mission statement by Jesus to save sinners. Again, from the very beginning, he knew what was his purpose. And then Apostle Paul puts in the mission statement of Jesus Christ to save sinners. Jesus Christ gave his life for everyone. But of course, it doesn't follow that everyone will be saved. Now, we studied this uh, last Sunday about the narrow and the broad way. Again, notice in Matthew 121 again. It says, he will save his people from their sins. Jesus will only save those who wanted to be saved. Jesus will only save those his 
people, those that are part of his kingdom, those that are willing to be a part of his kingdom, of his church. But the stubborn ones, of course, who don't want to be saved, then Jesus Christ will not save them. So the very purpose, number one, of Jesus, he came to us to save us from our sins, and then he put a stamp on it, tetelestai, it is finished. Now, the second one, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Now, when Zacchaeus learned that Jesus was coming to his town, he tried to squeeze in with the crowds. He, was, he tried to push and show those that are in the crowd you know, to take a glimpse of this person that's coming into his hometown by the name of Jesus Christ. And he found himself up on that tree. Now, many believe that Jesus Christ did this out of his curiosity. He wanted to see who this person was. And uh, because he probably heard the name Jesus Christ. So he climbed up that sycamore tree. And then Jesus Christ was going into this town. Jesus Christ was passing that street and finding Zacchaeus on that, on that tree, I believe it was not an accident. It was not an accident that Jesus would pass that town, would pass that particular street and would look up and would see Zacchaeus. It was not an accident. Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus. Now when the people saw that Jesus went into the house of Zacchaeus, they said to themselves, he had gone into the sinner's house to eat with that, with that man, with that sinner. Now, in response, Jesus uttered the words for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19.10. Now, if you will see the rooster of the, uh, uh, the 12 apostles, Matthew was also a tax collector, Right? And we, we, we know what's the reputation of a tax collector during those times. And uh, they were despised by the people. They were hated by the people because they were ruthless. They were ruthless in their scheme of collecting beyond that was that were supposed to be collected from the people. So that's why the people hated them. Now, Jesus found Matthew you know, when he was walking along that shoreline after he cured this paralytic person. And while walking, Jesus saw a booth, according to the Bible. And inside that booth was a man named Matthew who was doing his business. And I want to believe that it was not an accident that after Jesus healing that paralytic person, he went out of the house, walked along the shore, finding the booth, and inside finding Matthew. It was not an accident. He was looking and he was seeking for Matthew. It was on purpose. You know, when you are truly seeking God in your life, definitely you will find the Lord. You will find him because God intentionally seeks you first and this is the essence of the verse in the bible that says seek and you shall find when you seek god with all your heart definitely you will find god because he is also seeking you so jesus came to seek and save the lost now what he did to Zacchaeus, what he did to Matthew and what he did to all of those people, he saved them. That is why Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is son of Abraham. You see, so Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And on that cross, he said, and he stamped on Tetelestai. It is finish the third reason why jesus came here is to defeat death in hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 
Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who was the power of death, that is, the devil. Now because of sin, the consequence was death. Eternal punishment and separation from God. We can see in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. But you must not feed, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. There was a separation between us and God because of our sins. And Jesus' resurrection was a true and total defeat of death. Again, Hebrews chapter 2, 14 tells us through death, but through death, he might destroy the one who was the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus came when Jesus shouted out the words, it is finished. He was defeating death, the devil. Now Jesus overcame or overcome death once and for all and giving all of us, his faithful servants, the power of life, eternal life. That's why we rejoice in the victory over death because the certainty of eternal death is a shadow of the past. We now have the certainty of eternal life in heaven. In John chapter 14, verse 19, it tells us, because I live, you will also live. Because I defeated the power of death. I defeated the devil. Because I live, Jesus said, you will live. Amen. You will live. What a powerful message from God. Because I live, you will live. And that's what differentiates us from all other world religion. Again, it's only Jesus Christ that claim he will die and on the third day he will live again. And it's only him. All other religions in the world, all of their leaders, all of their so-called God, prophets, or what have you, they are all still six feet under the ground. But Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our God, is the only one living. He is alive. Amen to that. He is alive. And because he is alive, he is telling you and I that you will live also. Since Christ conquered death, it means that the faithful believers have also been granted access to victory over death. So when Jesus said it is finished, he defeated death. That's why he stamped on the word tetelestai. Paid in full. Another thing why Jesus came here is for, as an atonement for sins. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. You know, God was angry. He was angry. He was angry because of man's sins. Because of man's sins, there was, again, a separation between us and God. Now, with that anger of God comes judgment of eternal punishment. There would be punishment that awaits those who will not come to terms with God. Now, to appease this anger of God, a sacrifice was needed. There's something to be done. And that's where the word atonement comes in. Atonement, <clears throat> it was developed in the 16th century by the combination of at one man. Before, it's not atonement, but it was at one man, meaning set at one or to reconcile. So atonement, it accomplishes two things. 
Number one, it appeased God's wrath. And number two, it reconciles us with God. So that's the very essence of the word atonement. In Romans chapter 3, verses 23 to 25, Paul tells us that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because of sin, we fall short. We fall short of God's glory. It means you know, we cannot even touch, we cannot even touch the prize. We cannot even touch the trophy in front of us because we could not reach it. Because there is a gap. We fall short. We fall short. And you cannot have it because there is a gap between us and that prize. There is a gap because of sin. Now, it also means there is no unity between us and God because sin separates us from him. Now, verse 24 then tells us that it is <clears throat> through the redemption of Jesus that we are freely justified by his grace. Now, the question, how are we redeemed? Verse 25 tells us that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement okay? that the father freely gave us his only son can you imagine his only son to be the anointing sacrifice through the shedding of his blood it means jesus death jesus death now all this has to be received of course by an obedient faith now similarly <clears throat> excuse me let us go to the account of john in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now we see the word sin. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of <clears throat> the whole world. We see the word sin. We see the word advocate, which means the one who will intercede, who will intercede between God and us because there is a gap, because there is the sins. Okay. Again, the essence of the word falling short of the glory of God. There is a gap, so that's why we need an advocate. And we see the word atoning. Now, both Paul and John have similar thoughts. They have similar thoughts. Okay, we, we, we see here the word righteous one, or the word righteous. And Jesus is the righteous one. Now, what does that mean? Jesus being the righteous one. It is talking about the state of being. All right? The state of being, the quality of being of Jesus Christ. And what is it? What is the quality of being of Jesus Christ? That Jesus is blameless. And that's what the word righteous means. Jesus is blameless. He is free of any defects. No sin, spotless. And this is the kind of sacrifice that must be needed to appease the wrath of God and to reconcile us to God. The lamb that must be sacrificed must be blameless. Ergo, the word righteous. And Jesus is the only, he is the only and perfect candidate. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 18, 19, particularly in verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or spot. See, we are redeemed through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Therefore, it appeases God, appeasing the anger of God upon us and reconciling us with God, restoring back our relationship with him. So when Jesus said it is finished, it is for the atonement of our sins. And when he blurted out those words, he said, paid in 
full. He stamped the word tetelestai. The next one, Jesus' purpose, he came here on earth, he finished so that he could free us from sin's slavery. In Romans chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Now the word redeem, it is another business term, just like the word tetelestai. The word redeem, it means it is release affected by payment of ransom, redemption, deliverance, buyback from. It is transactional in nature, the word redeem. You know, man, man used to walk hand in hand and in harmony with God in the Garden of Eden. When sin entered the world, there was a separation between us and God. And what that means is we became slaves to sin. In Romans 8, 34, Jesus answered to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is what? Is a slave, slave to sin. So when we committed sins against the Lord, we actually became slaves to sin. Now the word redeem was used specifically about the purchase of a slave's freedom during those times. And the Bible used the word redeem because God purchased us. God purchased you and I from the slavery of sins so that we will not be shackled once again from that slavery of sin so that we could have our own freedom. We could have freedom. Remember during those times in the Garden of Eden, they used to, Adam and, uh, Adam and Eve used to walk hand in hand with God and in harmony with God. But because of sins, we became all slaves. And because of that, there, there is in store for those who are not faithful till the end, eternal punishment. Now, tetelestai, it means paid in full. The question is, did Jesus owe anybody for whom, you know, for him to pay something? No. Jesus did not owe anybody. He did not even owe the Father anything. You know, the reality is we owe God. We owe God big time because of our sins. Now, <clears throat> Listen to this. If somebody here has not yet accepted Jesus, please listen. You know, God loves you so much. I want you to, to take the, those words in. God, God loves you so much. And he wants you back so badly. That's why he gave his only son for you. His only son. Because you are slaves to sin. God doesn't want you to go into eternal punishment, but he wants you to be with him in heaven someday. Now, God wants us, God wants you to be freed or to be free from that sinful nature that leads to eternal death. And he wants you to bring, he wants you to bring to the side that leads to life eternal with him. Now to accomplish this, a, a ransom, must be paid, must be paid for you and I. And Jesus Christ was that ransom. Jesus paid everything in full. Jesus Christ redeemed you and I. And Jesus Christ's life, you know, when he was crucified on that cross, he used his life so that you and I can be once again back into the family of God. Now, I want you to see that. I want you to see that great love of God to you. Now, do you see how God loves you and I so much? God has purchased our freedom, and we are no longer slaves to sins. But the Bible said, slaves to righteousness. We are slaves to righteousness. Therefore, 
when you are no longer slaves to sins, there is now forgiveness of your sins because of the word redemption. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So when Jesus Christ came, he finished his purpose and thus freeing us from the slavery of sins. And therefore he stamped the word paid in full, tetelestai. He accomplished that on that cross. When Jesus shouted the word, it is finished, paid in full. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to do anything. Jesus did it for you. You don't have to pay a single dime. Jesus paid it in full. That last time. He eliminated the debt that we owed, you know, the humanity owed to God. He paid it in full on that cross, the debt of sin. You don't have to pay it with your own blood. Jesus did it for you. Your debt has been wiped out clean. You are white as snow. Amen. You are white as snow. Isn't that amazing? When Jesus shouted the word, it is finished. He accomplished all those things just to give you and I a place in heaven. Wonderful, isn't it? When Jesus suffered, bled, and died on the cross, he finished everything. The word tetelestai. Now we show our sincere empathy with, with Jesus by sacrificing ourselves also and dying with him. We accomplish this when we accept him by repenting of our sins and by being immersed, being baptized into his name. And that is our sacrifice. This is, our, this is how we nail our old self with him and have a full life and live a full life with Jesus Christ. Then we can rejoice with him. We can also shout victory in Jesus. And this is the essence of why a person must be baptized as it was uh, clearly illustrated in Romans chapter 6. Now, if you are not saved yet, if you don't have Christ yet in your life, may I invite you to come forward and declare your acceptance to him. I want you or we invite you to repent now and be baptized in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to receive what was finished by Jesus Christ. We all want to go to heaven someday. And by the Lord's mercy and grace, we will see each other in heaven because God said, Jesus said, it is finished. He paid everything in full. The gospel is yours. A blessed good morning to everybody. Again, an invitation for those who have not yet accepted the Lord. Now, shall we all stand please as we sing the song of invitation. <laughs>